is Monica Whelan Shields, who many of you know or know of. Uh, Monica is the founder and the president of the Orca Behavior Institute, which does non-invasive research on all the killer whales of the Salish Sea, the residents and the bigs. So today, this afternoon, she's going to talk to you about the bigs killer whales and just some of the changes that we've been seeing with them. So thank you, Monica, for being here. There we go. All right. Um, I first started spending time up in the San Juan Islands in the early 2000s, and back then, we hardly ever saw Biggs killer whales, um, also known as transient killer whales. I'll probably use those terms interchangeably today, but I'm talking about the same whales. Um, <clears throat> and even when we started the Orca Behavior Institute in 2015, one of our original goals was to track some of these changes that those of us who'd been either on the shores or on the water had, had started seeing with uh, how the killer whales were using the habitat, how they were behaving when they were in the area, and initially we were motivated by the changes we were seeing among the southern residents. Um, but very quickly we started seeing a lot of similar great changes um, in how big killer whales were using um, the habitat. And one of the reasons we've kind of switched to calling them big killer whales is because the name transient doesn't really apply so well anymore. Um, as things have, have switched around, and I'll show you some, some data a little bit later, um, they're the more resident population at this point in time. Um, as I mentioned, I started spending summers on San Juan Island in around the year 2000, and for the first several years I was up there, I was a research intern for the Whale Museum out at Lime Kiln Lighthouse on the west side of the island. And I was out there with Bob Otis's team, if you guys know him as well, and uh, we were tracking all the pass-bys of almost predominantly southern residents. And um, I was actually on the island for four summers before I ever saw a transient killer whale. And when we heard of a group of these uh, whales, Biggs killer whales that was in Harrow Strait, um, the entire team that was out at Lime Kiln, we all left and abandoned our research station and we went down, this is that corner on Hannah Heights, if you guys are familiar with the west side there, and we all went down there with binoculars and for pretty much all of us, it was our first time seeing Biggs killer whales. And I was so excited that I got my first picture of a transient killer whale. So even, you know, as recently as 20 years ago, they were pretty rare visitors to the area. And I mentioned um, at Orca Behavior Institute, we started in 2015. And even in that timeline, if you look at our summer encounters from May through September during our five field seasons so far, even in 2015, it was dominated by Southern residents. And we only saw the transient killer whales three times. Now that's shifted completely. Um, you can see we saw transients more than three times as we saw Southern residents in this last year. Um, so as these whales are coming into the area more often, they're spending more time here, their population is growing, there's, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to learn more about them, but there's also this kind of renewed interest in, in understanding these whales, and as many of us are out there um, in our roles as educators, there's an opportunity to share these stories um, that maybe we haven't had before. So that was kind of the motivation behind putting this talk together was to, to give you all a little more background on this population, where they kind of fit into the ecosystem, um, and some of the insights into uh, some of the particular family groups. So as you know, um, Orsinus orca is still considered a single species, but it's recognized as scientists to be a species complex, which means we know that there's kind of evolution in progress going on. We see some different types of killer whales all throughout the world. This shows kind of their global range map, and you can see they're found in every ocean of the world. Um, and everywhere you find them, you find these distinct populations that are genetically different and are starting to diverge from one another. Um, but what's really interesting here in the Salish Sea is our two ecotypes with the big killer whales and the resident killer whales, they overlap geographically, right? They're in the same area here, but they're not at all similar genetically. If you look at this uh, graph on the left, which uh, is basically showing different ecotypes of killer whales that have been identified around the world. And the closer they're connected to one another is the closer, the more similar they are genetically to one another. And so you've got the residents and the offshores up near the top, which means they're 
more closely related, they diverged from each other more recently. And our other ecotype is almost at the very bottom, the transient killer whales there. So these guys are sharing a geographic area, but they're among the most genetically distinct populations of killer whales in the entire world. So what that suggests is they, they're not sharing a recent common ancestor. At some point, there was probably some great migration of, of a population of killer whales or an individual kind of pioneering a new area and establishing a new population is that uh, the transient killer whales are potentially most closely re related to um, some of the Antarctic killer whales. So even though they're overlapping in range here, um, they're not at all similar genetically. So when we have multiple ecotypes that are still for now considered part of the same species, what's the same and what's different between these different ecotypes? Um, well, technically, they're all still the same species. They inhabit the same range. But beyond that, things start to get different very quickly. Um, you just saw in the previous slide that the genetics are quite different. As you know, their diet is different with the resident ecotype eating almost exclusively fish and the transient ecotype eating almost exclusively marine mammals. Um, their acoustic repertoire is different. They have entirely different sets of vocalizations that they use to communicate with one another with no overlap. Their social structure is different. Um, the residents often are in these larger pods made up of multiple natural lines with no natal dispersal. So both male and female offspring stay with their mothers. Um, um, in the bigs killer whales, um, natural lines are much more fluid. It's very rare to have multiple natural lines that travel together long term in sort of that traditional resident pod-like structure. And we do see dispersal of both male and female offspring in um, the bigs killer whale groups as well. So their social um, structure is quite different. Their behavior is very different. It's one of the uh, most distinct things when you see them in the field is not that they physically look different, but that they behave so differently with the residents most commonly in these large gregarious groups that are in the open waterways. They tend to be very surface active, very vocal. Um, whereas the bigs killer whales are in smaller groups, often um, in stealth mode when they're traveling a lot of the time, they might hug the shoreline and go inside all the little rocky bays and inlets and around the seal haulouts. And while they do travel in open water as well, they are much more common to be seen in some of the smaller waterways and inlets throughout the region than, than the resident killer whales are. And then um, morphology as well is, is both a, a similarity and a difference um, between these two ecotypes. Um, the bigs killer whales do tend to be larger, both in length and, and in girth. Um, they have kind of bigger heads as well. Um, but a lot of the other things that we say are, are sort of tips on how to identify the two ecotypes with uh, the bigs killer whales having pointy dorsal fins and solid saddle patches and, and things like that. Um, I, I caution people that those are guidelines, but as with almost everything we know about killer whales, there's very few hard and fast rules. So if we take a look at some of these things, um, first one there, the pointed dorsal fins of uh, big killer whales versus the rounded dorsal fins that um, we say the resident killer whales typically have. Again, that's a general trend, but doesn't hold up completely. That's J37 there, who has a very pointed fin. And similarly, um, there are some big killer whales with more rounded fins. Um, we also talk about the open versus closed saddle patches where uh, the resident ecotype is it's much more likely to have an open saddle patch, but of course many of them have solid saddle patches as well. And uh, I couldn't believe when I first met T37B1 there, who almost looks like it has an open saddle patch as well. So again, um, not a hard and fast rule, but a general rule between them. And then uh, something that I've heard a lot is that, oh, residents um, aren't capable of killing marine mammals. They've got weaker jaws compared to um, the resident killer whales. Um, and that's not entirely true either, because that's J31 um, with a porpoise in her mouth. Um, so we, we certainly know that um, the resident ecotype is capable of killing marine mammals. There's also been cases of the, the transient ecotype killing salmon. They just don't seem to consume that other prey type. Um, and so the, the really the dramatic difference between them comes down to their culture. Their culture is different and it relates to how they socialize with one another, how they use their habitat, how they travel throughout the year, how they disperse or don't disperse, and all of those things come back to their prey. And that's really the, the central point of their culture and kind of, and kind of who they are and why they are so different. 
So originally, um, in the 1970s, when it was figured out that we could photo identify individual killer whales in the region, they were using, um, Michael Vig and his colleagues were using the same um, method that they used to name and number all of the southern resident killer whales. So when they got through J, K, and L pod, they kept going, and there was M pod, and there was O pod, and there were these um, small little kind of outlier groups of killer whales that they were seeing. And it, it took until the 1980s until they realized that these were really um, a different type of killer whale. Um, but initially, all of what we now call uh, the Biggs killer whales uh, were given these uh, alphanumeric designations like M2, M3, just like we had J2 and J3. Um, and then, uh, you know, originally the theory was that they might be outcasts from the, from the residents, they were kicked out of the larger pods and forced into these smaller groups, and, and it really took uh, quite a bit longer to figure out that no, this was an entirely different type of killer whale that was behaving, socializing, everything in a very different way. Um, so in the 1990s, they, uh, researchers undertook the monstrous task of taking all the known members of the population and renumbering them with a T for transient killer whale. So all the names, um, all the numbers were kind of re-designated there. So uh, M1 became T1 and M2 T2, and they went through the entire population um, and gave them these T numbers because they don't sort themselves into pods quite the same way that the southern residents do. Um, another thing that they put into the naming system was because the whales disperse, they decided to track the genealogy of a particular whale in its alphanumeric designation. So you have T2, and then T2B would be the second calf of T2. T2C would be the third calf of T2. And so they add consecutive numbers or letters with numbers and letters alternating between different generations. So we go from T2C to her offspring, T2C1, and so on. So the names and numbers get cumbersome pretty quickly. You know, we're up to T124, A2A, and things like that, uh, whales that are out there. But the really cool thing about that is the genealogical history of that whale that's been documented over the last many decades is kind of encoded in its name. So with T124, A2A, we know that it's the first offspring of T124, A2, who was the second offspring of T124A, who was the first offspring of T124. So it kind of codes all of this right in their name, but it's another reason why they're starting to get more common names as well. Um, in terms of their diet, we know that they're eating marine mammals, but what exactly are they eating? Um, these are prey presented percentages that were uh, presented by uh, John Ford in a 2013 technical memo that he did, kind of reviewing the status of what's known as the West Coast transient population. But as we've been tracking um, predation events in the last just five years, um, the, the trend that he presented here, the percentages across the entire range of the West Coast transients from Southeast Alaska down to Central California, is very similar to what we're seeing in the Salish Sea. Um, where more than half of their diet is made up of harbor seals, and the top four prey items of harbor seals, harbor porpoise, stellar sea lion, and doll's porpoise make up more than 90% of their diet. Um, in addition to that, they're eating kind of a, a, a range of other marine mammal species, and not represented here are marine birds, which they also take probably more as kind of a playful, you know, cat and mouse kind of thing, rather than a substantial uh, nutritional component of their diet, but they do eat marine birds as well. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see uh, transients make a kill in the field because the, the first time um, I saw such a predation event and I was with somebody who had spent more time um, with that type of killer whales than I had and they're like, oh, they just made a seal kill. And I saw nothing. Like, it just looked like they were engaged in regular social behavior. And I said, how do you, how do you know? And they saw kind of a, a blood and oil slick on the surface of the water. So sometimes their predation events can be almost non-events from the surface, as far as we're concerned, watching them. They're um, very efficient at taking something down like a seal, and they're not always really theatric. If they're, they're hungry and they want to keep moving on, they can take a seal or several seals and move on with us barely noticing that they've even killed something. Other times, you get what's shown in this picture here, where 
Uh, several family groups uh, came together. This was uh, last May up in the San Juan Islands. And they spent um, about six hours taking down a stellar sea lion. And then they spent the next six hours playing with its pelt. Um, so that's the matriarch of the family group right here. And she's got a piece of that sea lion pelt that they were just flinging around like this for many hours. So sometimes you do get these uh, dramatic hunts, but they aren't always like that. So what's going on here in the Salish Sea? Um, and thanks to people like Orca Network and the Pacific Whale Watch Association, there's a lot of uh, data going back several decades now on sightings of these whales. And if you look at just sightings in particular, so this is the number of different groups that were reported in a year, you can see that things have been increasing over time. There was a spike there in 2005 when the Hood Canal Transient spent several months in Hood Canal. Uh, but for the most part, it was a slow increase, and then all of a sudden, in 2017, things went off the charts, and it was kind of called Year of the Bigs among those of us in the whale world here. And we, you know, we were very curious, is that an anomaly? Is that going to continue? And amazingly, in 2018 and 2019, the trend has still been an increase um, in sightings, even after that monumental year. Um, but this doesn't take into account anything like observer effort or the ease of finding particular groups of killer whales. Some people might say, well, the residents are here less, so people are looking for the big killer whales a lot more. So there's another way of looking at this that accounts for some of that observer uh, bias, which is to kind of code these sightings into an occurrence. And an occurrence is basically a unique group of killer whales that's in the area that has not been in the area for the previous week. Because if you look at all the sightings over time, the vast majority of the groups that come into the area here are here for six days or less at a time. So if you have one group that might have multiple males in it, they might be easier to find. Um, and they're seen six days in a row. That counts as one occurrence. If you have a smaller group that's just a female and her two young offspring, they might be harder to detect, they might be more stealthy for whatever reason, and they're seen only one time over the course of a week, that's also counted as an occurrence. So if you go through and code all the sightings data into occurrences to kind of see how many different groups are here and how often are they coming and going from the Salish Sea, you get a very similar trend. There's a little bit of gap in the data there, but there's been three different uh, scientific papers that look at seven year periods, which are represented here. And you see uh, that same general trend with that huge spike in 2017. So that begs the question, what's going on? Why are, why are there so many uh, more big killer whales here? And uh, the answer is kind of twofold. One is that uh, the population is growing. And as the population grows and the matrilines split into more smaller groups, you have both more whales and more matrilines in the area. So growing population is going to have more sightings. But on top of that, there's the prey. That we are at um, almost a you know, historic abundance as far as records show for seals, sea lions, porpoises. A lot of these marine mammal populations that were decimated in the mid 20th century have now recovered since the 1970s and the Marine Mammal Protection Act and when uh, these, these types of things started to be tracked. And with the recovery of those um, prey populations for the big killer whales, we see them spending more and more time here. Just one look at that is this, which shows um, some harbor porpoise population data for the inland waters of Washington from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And you can see that the recovery of the harbor porpoise mirrors almost exactly the increase of big killer whales in the Salish Sea. That's just looking at one of their uh, prey items, but if you um, take a look at things like sea lions and harbor seals, they found a similar trend. So there's more prey, there's more predators. This is looking at um, occurrences on kind of an annual basis. How many occurrences were there per year? But if you break that down by month, I'll uh, walk you through this graph here. So you see uh, every month of the year, and um, the, on the y-axis is the number of occurrences that occurred in that month. And this shows those three uh, seven-year time periods. So the bottom one is 1987 to 1993, then 2004 to 2010, then 2011 to 2016, with 2017 as kind of the anomalous year on its own up there. And you can see that overall increase in the presence of the whales in the Salish Sea. 
In particular, there's always been kind of a spike in August and September, which corresponds to the time period that the harbor seal pups are weaning. Um, so they're no longer with mom, they're off on their own, they make easy pickings for the big killer whales, they know that, they come here to take advantage of that. Um, in particular, in more recent years, we're seeing um, another spike in April and May, um, and there's there's always been a little bit of a lull in June and July, and uh, the theory is that that corresponds with when the harbor seal pups are weaning in Alaska. So many of these um, matcher lines might come into this area in the spring, head north to Alaska in kind of the early summer, and then come back into the Salish Sea in the late summer, kind of following um, the weaning of harbor pups as it, as it moves down the coast. So, in a lot of ways, we think of the Biggs killer whales as kind of a new presence in the Salish Sea, but they've been here for a really long time. And one of the most famous stories about captures in Washington State, um, the 1976 Bud Inlet 6, was actually um, Biggs killer whales. And we, you know, documented in the, in the books, and a story that's been told a lot is um, of the whales that became named T-13 and T-14, and how they were outfitted with uh, uh, satellite tracking packs and relocated up to Kanaka Bay on San Juan Island and tracked and released up there. Um, but another whale that was part of the uh, Bud Inlet 6 is a whale that came to be known as T-46. And I like to use her as a particular example for the difference that uh, one whale can make to a population. So T-46, you know, she was uh, captured but released in 1976. What has her family tree done since then? Um, you might think, oh, she's probably had a couple offspring. She might have a couple of grand offspring at this point. She has 21 living descendants. And uh, the first thing I take from this is that it gives me a lot of hope for the Southern residents that this is the impact, you know, given enough prey and everything else that a single reproductive female can potentially have on the population. She has multiple daughters that reach reproductive age, they begin reproducing, and all of a sudden you have a huge family tree that really is owed just to one successful breeding female. Um, another thing I really want to point out about these whales is they have amazing stories too. Um, many of us are fortunate to know about particular family histories among the southern resident killer whales because they've historically spent so much time here, we've gotten to know them as individuals, we track you know, the births and deaths and the, the exploits as they uh, travel into new areas and we have personal encounters with them. And there's really been less of that um, to this point with the Biggs killer whales. But again, as we're educating, there's an opportunity to, to learn about their life histories as well. And I just wanted to use this uh, particular family tree to illustrate a couple of those stories. Um, one thing that's uh, not as well known because it's uh, not quite captured in that alphanumeric nomenclature is that T123 is thought to be the offspring of T46. And the T123s spend a lot of time here in the Salish Sea. And back in 2011, um, T123 and her son T123A actually live stranded up near Prince Rupert in BC. And uh, they were on the beach for the entire tide cycle when the tide came back in. They successfully refloated and went on their way. And it was uh, not too long after that that T123 gave birth to T123C, who's nicknamed Lucky, because she was pregnant with Lucky um, while on the beach here, but was able to successfully get back in the water and give birth to Lucky. Um, so the thought was that maybe they were pursuing prey in shallow water. They somehow both got stuck, which is very unusual. Um, so, you know, some, um, some dedicated folks kept them wet and out of the sun while they were on the beach, and then they were fine. Um, another example is T46C2 right here, a whale known as Sam, who in 2013 um, ended up on her own in an inlet in BC, and she was just four years old at that point in time. And males and females do disperse in transients, but that's still very young, although we have seen some young whales kind of branch off and do interesting things. But this little one ended up in that inlet um, for quite some time and was eventually kind of guided out of the inlet um, by DFO because uh, they, were, they were concerned that you know, she was feeling stuck there or something like that, and, and uh, she left. And it was uh, almost a full year before she was sighted again, 
But when she was, she was not with her family. She was with another group of whales. And um, since then, T46 C2 has continued to be a really nomadic whale. Um, she has reconnected with her family at, for a period of time, but she did not stay with them. Um, so for whatever reason, she kind of got separated, spent some time on her own, and now kind of remains a lone roaming whale that goes to all these different uh, family groups. Um, and then another one from this match line that you guys may have heard about if you were following the news this year um, is uh, T46B2B, am I getting that right? Um, the whale known as Toluk, who's kind of one of these wh uh, rare white whales that we see occasionally in the region. Um, and it's, it's another really interesting one. It's, uh, he's not a true albino, but there's some kind of you know, genetic pigmentation thing going on there. And it's, it's something that's been seen um, a handful of times throughout this population. In some cases, it seems to be linked to a genetic condition that also um, has immune system effects, and the whales don't always make it to adulthood. Um, but there have been some other whales in the area that have looked like this as young whales and then gotten darker as they got older and uh, end up looking like regularly pigmented adults and seem perfectly healthy. Um, so we um, aren't really sure, uh, T46B1B, uh, what, what his future holds, but he spent a lot of time in the Salish Sea this year and got a lot of attention for his super unique coloration. Um, another match line I want to talk a little bit about is the T2s. Um, as we're spending more time with these whales and as their names, their alphanumeric names, are getting more cumbersome, there's been an effort in the last uh, year or two to start giving more of these whales common names. Um, some of these whales, like the T2s who were known early on, were given common names um, back in the 1970s. But the naming effort has been pretty sporadic throughout the years with different research groups and uh, aquariums and, and stuff like that, uh, naming certain members of the population. Uh, but more recently, within the last uh, year or two, there's a naturalist um, up in Vancouver who has made the great effort of trying to kind of get everybody on the same page, get everyone who has historically been a part of naming these whales together and make an effort to name all of the big killer whales that do not have these common names. Um, and there's, there's a Facebook group, um, it's Transient Nicknaming Group of the Pacific Northwest or something like that. So if you guys aren't on there, you should join it. And that's where a lot of these people um, are coming together, uh, suggesting names and then voting on them to, to get a lot of common names out there uh, for a lot of these whales that don't have them. Um, but going back to uh, the, the T2s in particular, um, these, this extended match line was involved in a lot of those early captures. Um, including another one of these white whales, um, just like Toluk, a whale known as Chimo, who was at Sea Land of the Pacific, um, off of Victoria there, and uh, had this um, genetic condition that uh, did eventually lead to its early death. Um, similarly, uh, T1, the whale known as Charlie Chin, and T2 um, were the whales that were kept um, for several months in Petter Bay on Vancouver Island. And if you guys have uh, read the um, Ford and Ellis book, Transients, they talk about this story where these were mammal-eating killer whales, right? But whales that we did not know about those differences at that point in time. And they refused to eat. They refused to eat all the fish that were offered to them until more than 70 days um, into their being held in this pen without food. Um, T3, the whale known as the scar jaw cow, passed away from having not eaten anything. And it was shortly after that that T1 and T2 actually took salmon and shared it and started accepting fish. Um, which, knowing what we know now about uh, the Biggs killer whale ecotype is, is uh, pretty remarkable. And they eventually were um, released and um, remained wild whales for a while. And then we have some descendants of T2 still in the area, including um, the whale T2C2, known as Tumbo, another one you guys may have heard of. This whale um, was born looking pretty normally, but over the first several years of his life started developing scoliosis with a really warped spine. And um, the amazing thing was that he appeared unable to participate or participate successfully in hunts. Um, so whenever this family group would make a kill, he would kind of hang back. The rest of the family would participate in the kill. Once they had succeeded, he would come in and share in the prey. And in 
almost all wild animal populations, if you have a physical deformity that keeps you from being fit, um, you're going to get left behind, you're going to get abandoned, but in, in this case, um, the family actually made this effort to, to provision him. There was um, seeing them as they moved through the San Juan Islands. Uh, sometimes he would end up trailing several miles behind them and they would stop and wait for him to catch up. And I love using uh, Tumbo as an example of uh, kind of counteracting that, that reputation, the traditional transient killer whale reputation of them being vicious predators. You know, we don't, we don't know about their, their family groups, their stories. Um, they're, you know, they're the true killer whale compared to the southern residents. Um, but Tumbo is a, is a perfect example of how that's not true, that they also have these very complex and caring social structures, these long-term bonds, and uh, the, the intelligence and the compassion that goes into Tumbo surviving as long as, as he did um, really speaks to the complexity of, of the big killer whale ecotype as well. Um, a couple of people asked me earlier today what his status is um, because it was heard that he was uh, missing and presumed deceased. And um, with transient killer whales, it's much more difficult to determine deaths in the population just because of all the dispersal that can happen. And uh, sometimes even particular family groups may not be seen um, for years at a time. But given um, his particular situation of being so dependent on his family, it wasn't at all unusual to see the rest of his family and maybe not see him because he was trailing behind somewhere. But since September, um, up in the Campbell River area, there's been maybe half a dozen sightings of his family group without him. Uh, so the prognosis for him in particular is not looking great. Um, he's, he's most likely deceased. Um, and I, uh, somebody else was asking, does it have anything to do with his age? Because he was beginning to get um, into that, that sprouter male teenage years. And I can imagine with the scoliosis that he had going on and the growth spurt that usually accompanies kind of that um, adolescence phase in killer whales that it could have uh, worsened his condition to the point where uh, he wasn't able to make it anymore. So here in the Salish Sea, we're incredibly lucky to have two populations and I have been so excited in the recent years to get to know this population better as they spend more time in the area, but they are absolutely no replacement for the southern residents, right? We have these two very unique cultures of whales um, that are very different, and they, you know, they give us an opportunity to learn very different things um, about killer whale culture and about the ecosystem. Um, one thing that's uh, theorized about but not talked about very often is the potential relationship between the two ecotypes. Um, many of you may know that they do not interact or interbreed with each other pretty much at all. Um, but what's really interesting is that when they do come into contact in the same waterway, it's usually the big killer whales that avoid the residents. And you might think that the bigs are potentially more threatening because they predate on other marine mammals, they might be able potentially to predate on the southern residents, but they seem to be the ones that go into avoidance mode. Um, I suspect that a lot of times the residents don't even know that there are big killer whales in the waterway because they're quiet, but I think the big killer whales detect the southern residents often acoustically because they're very chatty, and as soon as they come into acoustic range of one another, um, often the big killer whales will change course to avoid uh, a direct interaction with the southern residents. We've seen that um, several times on the west side of San Juan Island where we have uh, southern residents coming up from the south towards the lighthouse. We have big killer whales coming down Harrow Strait from the north and have seen either um, as soon as the southern residents round the point and kind of come into range of the hydrophone, um, We've seen, you know, the big killer whales either do a 180 and start porpoising like back up Harrow Strait or do a 90 degree and go all the way to the other side of the strait and continue south. So it's, it's pretty dramatic avoidance that we see. And so potentially overlaying uh, this, this prey issue and this increasing population of, of big killer whales is the fact that the residents are spending so much less time in the Salish Sea. And, you know, is that contributing to the transient killer whales spending so much time here because they no longer have to contend um, with the southern residents. 
And it's kind of one of those things we like to speculate about. It's very difficult to prove, but I definitely think there, there could be some tie in there because these, these two populations have to share this area but don't really want a whole lot to do with one another. So as, um, as the big killer whales continue to increase, I'm sure we'll get um, opportunities for, to witness some more of these interactions between these two ecotypes and, and see what will happen. Um, the one well-documented, potentially physical interaction between the two ecotypes um, occurred several decades ago, it was uh, documented by Graham Ellis up off Nanaimo, where uh, J-Pod had a new calf with them and seemed to aggressively pursue a small transient matriline, potentially have a physical altercation to kind of scare them out of the area. So if, um, if the Biggs killer whales are a potential threat to southern resident calves, southern residents historically have traveled in much larger groups, potentially able to kind of outman, so to speak, the, uh, the smaller Biggs killer whale matrilines. But again, those are trends that have been switching. Um, the southern residents are splitting into smaller groups much more often, and we're getting what we're kind of calling uh, tea parties of uh, the Biggs killer whales, where we will have 20, 30, last year for the first time, more than 40 of, um, of these Biggs killer whales together in one large social group. So again, it'll be really interesting to see what happens now if we have a group of big killer whales that outnumbers a group of smaller resident killer whales, will that interaction still be the same? And uh, we'll just kind of have to wait and see. Um, being able to look at these two populations side by side uh, leads to some really interesting insights. Um, one is that if you, if you look around uh, the big killer whale population, almost every single natural line and pretty much every matriline line that has a female of reproductive age has a calf under the age of two. And the traditional knowledge has kind of been that a um, successfully reproducing female killer whale might give birth to a calf once every five years. You know, she has an 18 month gestation period, a couple years of nursing, gets pregnant again, and you know, potentially could produce a calf every um, every five years or so. What we're seeing in the big killer whale population is that they're giving birth, they're immediately getting pregnant again. So they're able to handle the nutritional toll of both nursing a calf and being pregnant. And um, some of these females are starting to produce calves every two to three years, uh, which, is, which is just remarkable and is really a testament to what they can do reproductively if they are getting enough to eat. Um, this picture right here is from an encounter uh, last March. We had four uh, Biggs killer whale natural lines traveling together and um, all of them did have a calf under the age of two in the group. So you just get a lot of these opportunities to see little killer whales, which is, which is awesome. And of course is a, is a big contrast to what we've seen with the southern residents um, who in the last decade have twice gone three years without a successful birth at all into the population. Um, so if we uh, take a look at the two populations over the last seven years. Um, of course, the Biggs killer whale population is much larger. Um, there's, there's thought to be about 350 animals or so in what's called the coastal portion of the West Coast transient population. So those are the ones more likely to be seen near shore, including in our, in our inland waters here. There's um, another portion of the population that tends to be further offshore and is much more rarely encountered and kind of the demographics of them are, are less known, but about 350 whales or so in the intercoastal population, and of those, more than 250 of those individuals each year are coming into the Salish Sea, compared to about 60 if you go back 20, 30 years ago. Um, so the, the big killer whale population is much larger at um, several hundred whales versus 73 for the southern residents, but the deaths the um, number of deaths in the population is pretty similar if you look at uh, 2012 to 2019. But then if you look at births, there's the striking difference. And uh, that's, that's over 120 successful births into the Biggs killer whale population in the last seven years. So that's not accounting for the calves that did not make it. These are calves that are still alive today. Um, and that's, you know, as you can see, that's more than the entire population of the southern residents. Um, so it's, it's just incredible what we're seeing here. And these types of changes and these types of statistics, I think, are such incredible teaching opportunities 
when we're out there watching whales with people on shore or on a boat, regardless of which ecotype of killer whale we're seeing, we have the opportunity to compare and contrast these two populations. Um, they're sharing the same geographic area, so that means they're exposed to the same threats that come from the habitat. The same ship noise, the same toxins in the water, the same interference from military exercises, and everything else, because they're inhabiting the same area, they're exposed to the same physical environment. The big difference between them is their prey. The southern residents do not have enough salmon to eat, whales are dying, they are not successfully reproducing. Bigs killer whales, tons of seals and sea lions and porpoises for them out there right now. They're still carrying large toxin loads, they're still dealing with a lot of underwater noise disturbance, but they're able to successfully reproduce like crazy because they're getting enough to eat. And so I think this really um, is an opportunity for each of you as you're out there educating people about what's going on with these whales to point out these differences and to point out the importance of salmon recovery Yes, there are other issues in the environment that, that complicate this and need to be dealt with, but it clearly all comes down to prey, and nothing um, demonstrates that more clearly than the fact that we have the big killer whales thriving the way that they are right now. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, the question is, do big killer whales have greeting ceremonies? Um, and not that we've documented. Um, they, you know, we've, we've been seeing more of these large social groups and behavior that looks similar to kind of super pod behavior with lots of surface activity and vocalizations. Um, but the greeting ceremony seems to be specific culturally to the residents. Yes. Yeah, the, the question is with the uh, females reproducing so quickly, is there um, any evidence that they're weaning calves more quickly? Um, nursing is, is a difficult behavior to observe in the wild, um, so I don't think we, we really know. Um, we don't know really how long even um, either ecotype really nurses. Um, a lot of the information we have about rearing calves comes from captive whales, and of course things are going to be much different in the wild. Um, it, yeah, the, I'm amazed at how young the calves are when they start to be in the fray of the hunt for the big killer whales. Like, we'll see them a couple months old and they're right in there when they're going after a sea lion. Uh, so they teach them young, for sure. Um, but we see the same thing with southern residents, you know, um, J56 had salmon in her mouth at a very young age as well, seen from a drone. Um, so they probably both are, are starting to take solid food at a young age, um, but in terms of the difference between them, I think we just don't have the data. Yeah? I'm curious, the, the whales that breathe in captivity, the orca, do they separate the transient caught ones from, from residents, and if so, do they not breathe in captivity as well, or do they actually breathe in captivity? Yeah, the question is, are uh, resident transient ecotypes mixed in captivity? And uh, they absolutely have been. Um, you know, when the captive industry started, there was no knowledge of the difference in ecotypes. And so they mix, you know, residents and transients. They mix in whales from Iceland or Japan or wherever and kind of throw them all together. And um, one, I think that's the reason that we see more aggression um, among captive whales towards each other. Um, but they, they absolutely have interbred um, as a result of kind of forced interbreeding in captivity. Um, the really interesting thing to me is uh, acoustically, the whales that were wild caught seem to hold on to their acoustic repertoire from whichever ecotype they came from. And what's really fascinating is when a calf is born into captivity, it picks up the repertoire of its mother, but not the rest of the call types of the other killer whales in the social group it's exposed to. And so that really demonstrates kind of the strength of that cultural transmission of acoustics um, from mother to offspring. And it also suggests that calling these different languages might not be entirely accurate. Um, you know, it's not like a 
the resident is uh, speaking Chinese and a transient speaking English, right, where they can't understand each other at all, they're clearly communicating when they're in captivity, and I would argue clearly understanding each other as well. Um, so it, to me, it just opens up a whole can of worms of questions about how they're communicating and, and what they're communicating about and how that information is transmitted. Um, yeah. Yeah, there. Uh, there's artificial insemination going on in that also. Yeah, that's the, the forced interbreeding. <laughs> um, you mentioned there's a larger nature line groups. Is that show any noticeable changes in their predation behavior? Is that shown on the other global populations with large groups like that? Um, so are you asking if the, the lar transients being in larger groups has impacted their predation behavior? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, Robin Baird published a paper um, in the 1990s suggesting that the optimal group size uh, for transient killer whales was three whales, and to have partners for hunting, but not being so you know such a large group that you might be detected um, by the by the prey. And group the average group size has, has steadily been increasing, and uh, clearly they are still successfully predating on things. Um, I, I suspect there's just such an abundance of prey that, oh, if this one happens to get away from us because we're in a large group, there's another one right around the corner that we might catch. Um, if, if anything, it looks like they're, they're hunting more and they're, you know, they're very successful, uh, especially when going after something like a harbor seal. Um, so I, I don't think it's affecting them negatively. Um, and it, it certainly doesn't look like they're, they're coming into the Salish Sea to meet sort of their minimum, minimum metabolic requirements at all. It, it seems like they're coming here to feast. Um, and we've heard from some other researchers on the water that um, they're not just going by a seal haul out and taking a single seal and moving on. They're taking one seal per whale, and then some of those whales are taking another one in their mouth to go. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they are gorging, and um, we, we published a paper at the end of 2018 uh, taking a look at the, the number of harbor seals that might be being consumed by transient killer whales in the Salish Sea, um, because there's a question of the, the impacts of pinnipeds on salmon recovery, and, and is there a connection between, you know, the, the seals are eating the salmon, the salmon declines are affecting the southern residents, and, and how do the big killer whales play into that? Um, we were very conservative in our estimates in that paper, suggesting you know, that they were just coming here to meet their bare minimum requirements. And, and even if you make that assumption, they're taking uh, more than 1,100 seals a year out of this area, which is similar to the rate that humans were culling them in the, in the mid 20th century. And unfortunately, it's kind of surprising, but there is not a lot of really robust pinniped population data for Washington. Um, and so a big question mark um, for me, and, and really a key point going forward, is what's the harbor seal population doing now, and what are the impacts of the big killer whales um, on that population? Because uh, the, the estimates that I've heard are that, you know, as of 10 years ago, the increasing seal population had kind of leveled out, and with what we've seen in the last five years of the number of big killer whales in the area, I really expect that that um, that number is going down and that they're providing, you know, the natural population control that, that might be needed to kind of mitigate some of the impact of pinnipeds on salmon populations. Yeah. Yeah, the question is about uh, females offloading toxins and the, the increased birth weight in uh, Biggs killer whales and how that kind of impacts that. Um, it's, it certainly would be benefiting the mothers to be offloading toxins more regularly. Um, if they're nursing and giving birth almost constantly, they're almost cycling you know, toxins through very quickly. Um, I, I don't know of any recent studies that have looked at the toxin loads like in transient females um, in particular and how that's been impacted by this population growth rate surge that we've seen in recent years. I don't know that anybody um, is out there collecting those kind of samples on them right now. Um, what's 
uh, what's really interesting is that they must have, I mean, we know because they're a step higher on the food chain that they're carrying even higher toxin loads than the southern residents, right? They're eating, they're eating salmon, or they're, they're eating seals who eat salmon as opposed to eating the seals directly like the southern residents do. So they're kind of a trophic level above, which means they get more of this biomagnification and bioaccumulation um, than the southern residents do. And they're dealing with it. Um, and the calves are surviving as well. So it's, it's not like the mothers are surviving because they're offloading toxins more often. Um, I think it, it just comes down for the mother and the calf to the fact that they are carrying these toxins, but they're able to store them in their fatty blubber rather than metabolizing them because they're getting so much to eat. Yeah. Yeah, the, the question is, um, if I was at all involved in the ORCA task force process that happened here in uh, Washington State, um, and, and if they were kind of informed about a lot of this data and the, and the point towards prey is the importance. Um, I did attend a lot of those meetings um, and gave public comments where I was given the opportunity to, as did um, a lot of other people in this room. Um, the, the task force process had a lot of pros and cons associated with it. Um, you know, they brought a lot of people to the same table that had not been brought to the same table before. Um, but I think one of the real shortcomings was there was not an opportunity for the science to be presented to the entire task force at the beginning of the process. And it felt like a lot of time was spent just trying to get these people who have not had anything to do with killer whales up to speed on even the fact that we have two ecotypes here. Um, I remember it was like, it was the you know, third or fourth meeting in the first year and one of the task force members said, wait, the Southern residents leave Puget Sound? Like, they didn't even know, you know the entire geographic range of these whales. So um, that was, it was definitely a frustrating point that, um, that that effort to communicate the science to these people who were beginning to make some of these decisions didn't happen and they kind of came up to speed throughout the process rather than right at the very beginning. Um, so a lot of this data did did eventually get disseminated, but not in a very efficient manner, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's time for uh, one more question. Let's go up there. Yeah, you asked uh, two questions that are both um, of great research interest uh, to me and to us at the Orca Behavior Institute. Uh, the first is, do transients throughout the population have different dialects like the southern residents do? Um, we don't think so, but we don't really know. Um, up until very recently, it was very rare to hear them vocalizing much at all, but we're getting the opportunity now to collect um, a lot more recordings on these whales and we want to start looking at are there natural line differences in their repertoire and that kind of thing. But it's, it's generally thought right now that the entire repertoire, which is only something like eight different vocalizations, it's much smaller than like the 30 call types that the southern residents have. But it's thought that those vocalizations are shared across the entire population. Um, your second question was about are they, are they bringing new whales into the area or you know, are, they, are they leaving the Salish Sea and coming back with their friends? And um, that's definitely something um, we're interested to, to dive, take a deeper dive on um, with social associations is some of these match lines have been using the Salish Sea regularly since the 1970s. And we really want to see if when these new match lines that have never been into the Salish Sea come in, are they coming on their own or are they coming with one of these well-established match lines that sort of used to using the area? And uh, we really you know, haven't had the, the time yet to, to take a deep dive on that, but we're, we're interested in looking at it for sure. Um, because we are definitely seeing uh, new whales from the West Coast transient population coming into the Salish Sea almost every year. And uh, yeah, it's a big question. How are, they, how are they hearing about the feast here, for sure? All right, I think we have a break coming up next, um, so I'm happy to stick around and answer more questions. Thanks.